know, we smell this good. But uh, first and foremost, I want to say it's an extreme, extreme honor and privilege to be here before you all. I got great respect and admiration for education, right, for educators. My wife is an educator for 11 years. I met my wife when we were in the fifth grade. Right now, I never forget me. They're like, oh, yeah, I said the same thing. I'm first grade. And I'll never forget, when I first met her, we were at the park in our neighborhood. And we grew up two blocks away from each other. And just like kids, we were in a circle, right, just talking about life. And my wife was being raised by her grandmother at the time. And I was coming up in a two-bedroom home. There was 14 of us living there. And we were in a circle, and we were just asking each other as kids, hey, man, what do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be when you grow up? Right, you had different people. Man, I want to be an artist. Right, I want to go to the NBA. Me, myself, I want to go to the NFL. Now, I'll never forget, when we got to my wife, my wife says, I want to be a teacher. And everybody in the circle was like, man, you, you want to pass out homework? Right? <laughs> that was as far as the perspective went, right? And I'll never forget her response. She said, no, I want to do what my second grade teacher did for me when I lost my parents and they got murdered and she stepped in the gap and she helped my grandmother raise me. And it shifted our perspective. My second mother was a teacher, special education. My father's wife, a teacher and assistant principal in education. My mentor, who's my eighth grade math teacher and basketball coach, who I still talk to every Monday morning at 5 a.m. is an assistant principal in Atlanta, walked my wife down the aisle at our wedding. I tell you these things to give you context about the importance of education in my life. I remember being up at the school in June with my wife. And I'm like, babe, school doesn't start for another two months. And she's like, yeah, but I'm so excited about the bumblebee theme in my classroom. And I was like, all right, let me go get the bumblebees, right? But I'll never forget, when I was a kid coming up inner city Atlanta, born to a mother at 16 years old, 125 born, two bedroom home, 14 people. Had dreams, goals, and aspirations, just like any other kid. I wanted to do something great with my life to change the trajectory of my family's life. My mother was working a double shift at Wendy's. My father wasn't present at the time. Now, I'll never forget, me and my cousins, we started playing tackle football in the street. We loved the game of football. One of my first cousins, he ended up coming to college here in Denton, Texas, to play at the Mean Green. And so we loved the game of football, right? And I'll never forget, we're playing in the street, getting after it, street light the street lights, light pole will come on, and we had 10 or so minutes before we had to go in the house. And I remember saying to a man, if I make it to the NFL, maybe we can get our own beds one day. If I make it to the NFL, maybe I can change my grandmother and my mother's life. And it was like, yeah, ain't that sounds cute, but nobody in our family has even graduated high school. So it sounds good, but the chances of it happening are slim to none. I was like, yeah, but if we want it the way we say we want it, man, we can make it happen. All we got to do is work for it. Right? And at the time I attended a middle school, I'm an Atlanta public school kid by the name of Sammy E. Cohen. Right now in Atlanta, it's Martin Luther King Middle School. And I'll never forget, we go in this class on the first day, me and my buddies, stoked, excited. Right, and when we go in this class, we have this little drill we used to do, and we're not proud of it, we're just being kids. Right, and we go, and whenever we would change classes, me and my three or four little buddies, we would always run into the restroom. Right, we would turn off the lights, and that was our time to play. And so when people come in the restroom, we would wrestle, we would play with them, we would joke around. Right, and we ran in the restroom when the classes were changing, and I would always set up in the back stall. Right, and I'm in the back stall, and my two buddies were in front of me, and I'm sitting there, and they hit the lights. And I hear one of my buddies say like, oh. And I'm like, man, I never heard that sound before. And my other buddy, he was like, oh man, wait. I was like, I never heard that sound before. Let me hit the light. And when I hit the light, it was my 23-year-old new teacher at Crim, Crim High School. And he had both of them in the headlock. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, you next. I was like, nah, I yield. <laughs> he was like, it's a new day, eh? I was like, I see. And after school that day, I was on the corner of my neighborhood with my uncle, who served a time in prison in Alabama right now. And I wasn't doing anything illegal. I was just standing on the corner hanging out. That's how we did when we came up. And a red Dodge Ram pickup truck pulled up. And my uncle looked at me and said, hey, who's that? I was like, I don't know. And as the window was rolling down, 
I'll never forget, I looked at him, I said, that's my math teacher, my basketball coach. He said, what does he want? I said, I don't know. And at that point, my teacher was getting out of his truck. And he said to me, what are you doing out here? I said, I'm hanging out. He said, no, you didn't hear me. What are you doing out here? I said, I'm hanging out. He said, get in the truck, man. Point me to your house. Got in his truck. I pointed him to my house. We pull up. I get out of the truck. And he says to me, ain't you better than this? I was like, I hear you, sir. He was like, no, man, you're better than this. Like, you can beat this. You can beat this in Bible. I was like, I hear you. He's like, no, man, you got greatness. And he starts saying all the quotes. I was like, yeah, man, I hear you. It's cool. I said, but the same corner you just picked me up from? I said, when I come to your class in the morning, my uncle wears a 2X t-shirt. I'm 135 pounds. When I come to your class in the morning, I'm going to wear the same 2X t-shirt, and he's been in the corner and all night. And so when I come to your classroom in the morning, I hear the words you're saying, but I'm coming from a real situation. I said, most mornings when you see me and my three younger cousins, when you walk in the cafeteria and they got us on the wall from breakfast duty and the cafeteria administrator is saying, Johnson boys, Inky, you're the oldest. Why do you let them jump the line every morning? I said, we don't want to jump the line every single morning. I said, my three younger cousins, the only thing they know is we didn't eat the night before. And so when they in the cafeteria, they're just running to the front of the line, not trying to be rude, not trying to be disrespectful. They didn't eat the night before, and so they're just home. I said, so I hear you talking, but I'm coming from a real situation. He said to me, oh, you think I'm joking? I was like, no, I didn't say that. He said, I'm going to show you. I'm going to be here in the morning, and I'm going to pick you up. I said, it's probably just words. And the next morning, I was sound asleep on the floor. Me and my cousin slept on pallets. And I hear somebody leaving on my front door. And my mother ran and she opened the door. And I hear her talking to someone. And she walked over to me on the floor and she shakes me. And I look at her and she said, ink it up. Your teacher and coach is at the door. I was like, oh, he was serious. <laughs> I was like, but just words. It, it went outside of the school with it. And I walked to the door. He said, get dressed. I got dressed. I went out and got in his truck. He said, man, listen, I'm going to pick you up from this year until you graduate high school. He said, I'm going to play you in the game of one-on-one -on -one basketball every single morning, and I'm going to make you recite a proverb every single morning. I said, it'll probably last two weeks. Every single day, he showed up like possible. And one morning we were in the gymnasium, and I'll never forget the principal, Dr. Jackson, walked in. And he said, DeMarco Mitchell. He said, yes, sir. He said, I heard you been giving Emporius Johnson Proverbs. He said, yes, sir, I have. He said, stop it, I'll have to fire you. And I got it. I understood it. Church and state. I, 100%. I got it. And without any hesitation, he said to me, Inky, don't worry about it. He responded to the principal and said, well, you just going to have to do what you got to do because his life is working. And he had three kids of his own. He had adopted three more from the Atlanta public school system because they didn't have anywhere else to go. Had three of his own, had adopted three more from the Atlanta public school system because he knew they didn't have anywhere else to go. On a teacher's salary. And so I speak to education and I, I, I value education because I'm the spirit of what you guys do. Right, I'm the spirit of when you show up every single day and you got your problems at home and you still instill belief into a kid because you see something in them that the world can't see or they can't see because they're going back to situations and circumstances that their perspective won't let them travel to a certain place. I'm the spirit of what you guys do. Right, I understand in life people don't burn out, people don't quit, and people don't stop because of what they do. People burn out, people quit, and people stop because life makes them forget why they do it. Right? Like, I look, at, I look at teachers as superheroes, right? Over the past couple of years, you hit COVID, you hit the pandemic, people praise education. Man, it's awesome. The pivot, I'm so grateful for it. Everything is great, and then you get in the midst of it, and people can't decide, should we wear a mask or we not? You get in the midst of what we do. How, how should we go about this? And then it goes from being celebrated to being blamed. And it's a mission and a purpose that's attached to it. A long time ago when a person said, I want to teach kids, like my wife is brilliant. She could have done anything in the world, but the only thing she wanted to do was show up every single day and impact kids. My mentor, brilliant, could have done anything in the world, and the only thing he loves doing every single day is getting up and impacting kids. 
And so I came from a place to where my first day of high school, a cop asked me, what's your plan, little man? I said, my plan is to go D1. I want to go to college. I was at the lowest performing public school in the state of Georgia. Not just at Atlanta Public, in the state of Georgia. I tell people all the time, we were TSA before TSA. We had nothing to touch it before they had it in the airport. And we would step up, put both arms out, search us, crown in the head, bottom of the feet, come back up to the torso. And I stepped up and they said, what's your plan? I said, I plan going D1. Cop responds, you'll probably go to cell block D1. And he goes to walk off. I said, man, I've never seen him a day in my life. He's probably making a mistake. And I chased him and I kept up to him. I tapped his shoulder. I said, excuse me, sir, I never saw you a day in my life. You gotta be making a mistake. He said, no, I know about you. I said, sure. He said, you had two uncles coming to the same school. I said, yes, sir. He said, don't think serving 20 and 40 years in the federal penitentiary, not even too far away from me? I said, yes, sir. He said, an apple doesn't fall too far from a tree. You'll probably end up in cell block you want. I said, we'll see. He said, we will. That morning, I had just left my, my teacher and my mentor. The topic of conversation was not allowing an individual's words to dictate your future. I knew exactly how to respond to it. And so my senior year at the University of Tennessee, it was special for me for a number of reasons, but none were more special than in my senior year at Crim High School when I went into the cafeteria and I had my scholarship papers from the University of Tennessee and I went into the lunchroom and the first person I went to see was that cop. All right? And I slid the paper across the table to him. He stood up, he looked at it, he said, young man, let me ask you something. He said, how would you do it? He said, because I know you probably thought when I said that to you, I was trying to break you. I said, yeah, it came across that way. He said, man, I want you to understand something. I've been at this school before you got here. I'm going to be here after you leave. He said, but I heard so many people say what they were going to do and ended up going to the gas station across the street, selling drugs, get sent off to jail and prison. He said, so I just wanted to understand when I said that to you, would you retreat? He said, you know what, you're probably right. Will you step forward, press forward, and fight me about my words? I said, man, you thought I was just trying to go to college? I said, I was trying to break a generational curse in my family. Nobody in my family had been to college. I said, you thought I was trying to go to college? I said, you thought I was trying to go to college? I wanted to change the perception of the school. I wanted the next time a mother was in the car with a kid and they was at the stoplight in front of the school, I wanted the mother to say, hey, you know that kid, Inky Johnson? He's a product of Prim High School that's out in the world doing some good. I wanted to change the perception of the school. Like the coolest thing I was riding on campus and my guy told me, he said, man, that's a stadium from the 70s. I was like, man, that's amazing. Right, the tradition, like that's incredible. I said, you thought I was trying to just go to college. Like I wanted to change the whole thought process of the school. When I was in high school, every high school in Atlanta came to my mother and told her, if you want your kid to go to college, transfer him. He'll never make it to college from this school. Every day, my mother would come to me and say, Inky, if you want to go to college, we got to leave this place. And I would say, nah, ma, I think I can make it from here. Lowest performing public school in the state of Georgia. And they would meet me. I would be walking home after baseball practice with my book bag. A coach would drive up, 745 bids. Hey, you Inky John, yeah, I'm Inky Johnson. Get in the car, I want to give you something. I'm like, nah, I'm cool at Prim High School. Every coach came every single day. My mother transferred me. My sophomore year, I go to a school, beautiful facilities, got everything on the face of the planet. I told them I didn't want to be there. They said, come on, man, just stay here. We'll get your scholarship to the University of Georgia. I was like, I'm cool. I think I can make it from where I'm from. They said, the school is not going to accept you, Inky. Your grades are not up to par. I said, call them. That's my people. Call them. And I'm standing in the principal's office. He calls my high school. The principal picked up the phone. They said, we got this kid, Inky Johnson. They didn't even let him finish his sentence. They said, that's our guy. Send him back. <laughs> right? And when I got back, he told you. And when I got back to that high school, I was on mission. Because I wasn't just fighting to get back to go to college. I had educators in that school that cared for me. I had educators in that school that went to bat for me. I had educators in that school that saw something in me, but I couldn't see it in myself.
myself and everybody said, that kid will probably never make it. I would walk into a classroom and the teachers would say, hey, they don't know you. They don't know where you come from. They don't know your gifts, your talents, and your abilities. You special, man. They don't know where you come from. And I walk outside of that school and say, man, I got somebody that's fighting for me. One of my most special days at the University of Tennessee was my first year, my summer year. I'm up there working out, and I'm in the weight room getting it in, and a coach comes in, and he says, Inky, somebody's here to see you. And it was my social studies teacher. And she was fighting cancer. And she had a group of students. She was fighting stage four cancer. And all of my guys was in the weight room and they stopped. He said, I got somebody here to see you. And I looked over, it was my social studies teacher, Ms. Martin Lakers. And she said, and Glorious Johnson, the world knows this, ain't it? She said, and Glorious Johnson, she said, I'm sure you probably heard I've been fighting for my life. I said, yes, ma'am, Ms. Martin Lakes, I have. She said, before I leave this world, I wanted to bring a group of students up here to this campus to show them a product of what we believe and what's possible. And she took them and she hugged them. And she said, this is the product of where the kids come from. And so I'm gonna be honest, when I got my injury at Tennessee, people always talk and say, man, he was eight games away from becoming a potential first round draft pick. People always talk and say, man, this guy ran a 4.38 and a 40 yard dash. He benched fresh 325 pounds. They always talk about the football accolades, and I was cool. I played ball, it was great. But what I remember most about September 9th, 2006, the game against the Air Force, two minutes left in the fourth quarter, I went to make a routine tackle in my career ended. What I remember most about that day, I was in a position to where I went to make a tackle, something I've been doing since I was seven years old. And at the point of contact, when I hit the guy, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. I'm speaking because I'm a product of the spirit of what you guys do. I've been traveling the country for 16 years, and people see me, but they don't know the forces that are behind me. I went to make the tackle, I hit the guy, it seemed as if every breath in my body left. My body was completely limp, fell to the ground, blacked out. Never experienced anything like that before in my life. My body goes completely limp. I hit the ground, I black out, I come to. When I come to, my teammates are running over to me. They say, ink it up, let's rock. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean you can't? You always get up, you're our guy. I said, I can't move. They said, what do you mean you can't move? You're captain, man, get up. I said, there's a shock going from the crown of my head to the bottom of my feet. I can't feel anything. The shock eventually left and it stayed in my right arm and hand. They brought the spine board out. They put me on the spine board. They wheeled me off the field to get me to the ambulance. They said, we'll take you over, put you in the room, run a couple of tests, it's football, things happen. They take me over, they run their tests, they put me in the room. My mother comes in. She kissed me on my forehead. She said, Inky, it's football, things happen. You'll be fine. She goes to exit the room. My coach comes in. Says, Ink, man, something really traumatic has happened. And he exits the room. And when he exits the room, I'll never forget the head doctor runs in. And he's screaming. And he's saying, guys, guys, come in here. Got to rush this kid back to emergency surgery. He's about to die. And I remember responding to him. And I said, like, die, die? Like, wait for me to die? <laughs> like, like, die? He was like, yeah. I said, man, what happened? Everything was so calm and cool. Like, what happened? He said, yeah, Ink, we went in to run the test. We noticed you ruptured. You said, play in artery and you bleed internally. He said, we got to rush you back and take the main vein out of your left leg and plug it into your chest in order to save your life. He said, I hate to inform you, but football career is probably done. He said, your arm and hand will probably never be the same again. He said, we got to perform the surgery right now, but you won't be alive anymore. I said, let's go. And the next morning I woke up, I had six incisions down my left eye, one incision across the left side of my neck, one across the right, twice through my right ribs, cut out my right pec, bottom of my armpit to the bottom of my hand, 350 staples in my body, and banished me from my neck to my knees. I remember looking at myself in the mirror, I didn't even look the same. I remember my mother coming into the room and she just broke down. My father, he couldn't even step into the room. My coach comes in, Inky, we're gonna send you back to Atlanta. Something traumatic has happened to you. 
I said, Coach, I'm not going back to Atlanta. He said, I'm going to let you have a minute. He exits the room. The next person that walked into the room, my teacher, my coach, the one that knew me before Knoxville, Tennessee, before the University of Tennessee, before the city, before college football, the one that knew me a long time ago, the one that knew me when I was a 13, 14 year old kid. Now I'll never forget when I saw his face, I get emotional when I talk about it. I saw his face, I just broke down. And I started crying. I said, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry. I'm telling you this because I'm the spirit of what you guys do. I said, I'm sorry, man. He said, what you sorry for, eh? He said, what you sorry for? I said, I felt like if I made it to the NFL, I could pay you back for what you did for me. I said, I felt like, man, if I made it, like, I could pay you back, like I could help you, man, all the things you did for me. Like when something happened in my family, my mother didn't call a deacon out of church. She called my teacher. When me and my cousin went through something, they didn't call somebody at the church. They called my teacher. It's the same teacher that was in the class and tapped me on my shoulder and said, hey, man, one day that's going to be your wife. It scared the life out of me. <laughs> And when he walked my wife down the aisle and gave her away at our wedding, he winked at me and said, I told you so. <laughs> I'm telling you this because I'm the spirit of what you guys do. I said, I can't pay you back, man. And I'll never forget, he looked at me. He said, you think I did what I did for you so you can make it to an NFL? I said, yeah, man, I thought that was part of it. He said, man, you broke the NFL. You watch the freaking NFL. He said, I don't care about the NFL. He said, I did what I did for you so you could become a decent man one day. He said, the only thing I want from you is for you to finish what you start. He said, the only thing I want from you is for you to pay for with the sacrifices, the work ethic, and the belief that we've instilled in you. That's the only thing I want from you, for you to carry that forward. The only thing I want from you, Inky Johnson, is for you to complete what you start. He said, that's it. You don't owe me a thing. He said, you don't owe me a thing, son. I did what I felt I was called to do. This is my life's work. It's not predicated upon situation, circumstance. The only thing I want for you to do is to complete what you start. When my injury happened, I was on track to graduate in three years. I still graduated, and I had to learn how to write all over again with my left hand, and I was right hand dominant. I went on to get my master's a year after that. I'm the spirit of what you guys do. I know oftentimes we feel as if we don't see the impact of our work. Right? There's a quote that says, don't judge each day by the harvest you reap. You judge each day by the seeds that you sow. Right? Don't judge each day by the harvest you reap, but by the seeds that you sow. I'll never forget, pre-pandemic, I was traveling to a and I had a trip scheduled out to a and and I had a connecting flight in Dallas. And I would always text my wife to let her know how things are going, and I'm texting her, and I'm getting in line, and I'm pulling up my boarding pass, and I'm standing there, and I'm about to hand it to the gate agent. And right as I'm handing it to the gate agent, I see the pilot coming off the plane. And the pilot is walking at a pretty brisk pace, and he had his briefcase in his hand. And right when he got next to me, I said to him in a joking manner, I said, hey, brother, uh, where are you going? I was like, where that way? He was like, yeah, we hit a bird. I was like, like a little bird? He was like, yeah, we hit a bird. I was like, no disrespect to the bird, but the bird gone, right? Playing bird. That's no match. He was like, yeah, we could possibly be blood on the plane, things to get the plane. It's just a protocol. He said, so we got to sit for a while. It's a protocol. I said, great, man. Would you mind if I sit beside you? I want to understand the protocol. Guy was nice as all get out, introduce myself to him. We take a seat, and he says to me, Inky, we'll be fine unless they bring the plane tow truck. He said, if they bring the plane tow truck, we'll have to wait two and a half, maybe even three hours. Traveled almost 16 years, never heard of a plane tow truck in my life. <laughs> Within three minutes, what do you think showed up? Freaking plane tow truck. <laughs> three hours go by, we board a new plane. We get on the plane, we're getting situated, the plane starts pulling off the runway, pilot comes over the intercom and says, hey guys, I hate to inform you, but we have to go back to the gate. Everybody's like, yeah, he's probably joking. 
He says, no, they forgot to load the luggage. <laughs> and the people lose it. I believe I had the mad guy on the plane sitting next to me. Start smacking the seat, smacking the wall, we pull him back up and I say to him, I'm trying to just calm him down. I'm like, man, I just want to see who forgot to load the luggage. Like, I just want to see. And as we pull back up, I'm looking out of the window and I spot the luggage bin. Two gentlemen on both sides of the luggage bin. One guy got a Sprite, the other guy got a Dr. Pepper, remember it vividly. And they're doing a floss dance like my 10 year old son. I was like, oh, that man will be the loca. It's no luggage on the plane. And when we stop, I said to him, my challenge is not that there's no luggage on the plane. That's not my challenge, right? My challenge is not even that we're delayed. I expect to get delayed. That's a part of travel. My challenge is not even that we've encountered a level of opposition and adversity. I said, my challenge is this. Oftentimes as people, we live our lives and we feel as if if opportunity arises in opposition, adversity, a challenge, uncertainty, we'll just be ready for it and we'll just rise to the occasion. And I think we all know in life, we don't rise to the occasion, we revert back to our training. Meaning the individuals that we were prior to the opposition, prior to the challenge, prior to the uncertainty, prior to COVID, that is the individual that's gonna show up in the midst of it every single time. My favorite quote in the world is Dr. King's quote. That says, you judge the true character and of a person not by where they stand in times of comfort and convenience. You judge the true character and of a person by where they stand in times of challenge and controversy. I look at you guys as superheroes. A guy said two weeks ago, he said, man, I'm all for when we go out and we see people in the service of the military and we thank them. He said, we should. He said, every single right, we should. He said, but I also feel as if every time we see a teacher, administrator, somebody in education, we should stop and we should thank them because the work they do is equally as important. Right, so I value what you do. But I also understand this, and I think you can agree with me. Everybody knows what to do when the sun is shining. Everybody knows to show up when they got the great student. Everybody's gonna show up when the culture is great. Everybody's gonna show up when things are going their way. But it's just like a video that I saw on YouTube of a burning building and people were jumping out of the building, people were running out of the building, and there was a group of firemen and they were circled up in front of the same building. And their arms were locked up. And while people were jumping out of this building and people were running out of this building, you had a group of firemen locked up in a circle getting ready to run into the very building that people were running out of. And when I looked at it, I'm like, man, somebody in that circle had to think, like, man, I love going to baseball practice with my kids. If I run into this building, it's a strong possibility I may never get to do that again. Somebody in that circle had to say, man, like, I love going on date nights with my wife. If I run into this building, it's a strong possibility I may never get to do that again. But I have to thank the captain, right? The leader, the superintendent, the front, like the one. I had to say something to the extent of, hey guys, you know when we get the car to go up in the tree to get the cat? That's cute. But this is why we sign up to do what we do. We're the people they call when everybody else is running out and they don't believe in a kid. We're the people they call to run in. When everybody else can't see the potential in the kid, we're the one they call to run in. When everybody else is telling the kid what they won't become because of their family lineage, we're the people that they call to run in. I just want one thing from you. As incredible as you are, as great as you are, as beautiful as you are, as talented as you are, as skillful as you are, you guys are awesome, man. Like, you don't need me to tell you that. The work you do is incredible. I just want one thing from you. In life, people don't burn out and people don't quit and shortchange because of what they do. In life, people burn out, people quit, and people shortchange because life makes them forget why they do it. My only ask of you is to never allow life to make us forget why we started and why we show up in the first place. Because when it's all said and done, I think we all can agree, when the clock stops, it's not about anything materialistic or superficial. When the clock stops, it's about two things. It's about who we become in life, and it's about what we give back in life. And every single day of our lives, we have an incredible opportunity to become something great, but most importantly, every single day of our lives, we have an incredible opportunity 
It impacts something great. Never forget and never allow life to make us forget why we do what we do. Keep living and keep loving. That's my time. God bless you. Thank you.